It's time for the Daily Stand-Up Podcast presented by Agile Dad with your host, Lee Henson. Without any further ado, let's get started. All right. So someone pointed out to me that there was an article that was recently written called The Product Delivery Triangle. It was a product management article, and it excited me. It talked about reimagining the popular delivery methodologies in terms of the edges of the triangle. So a gentleman by the name of Ramiz wrote the original article, and it says, let's cut to the chase. There are too many frameworks out there for delivering your products. I would disagree. I think there's the right number of uh, frameworks out there. The problem is people don't understand how they work together. It's just like we were discussing the other day. It's like having pieces of a chessboard and understanding how all the pieces work together to achieve a common goal. So if you're lucky, you get to participate and choose a couple. If you're unlucky, you end up working in safe. Now, that's pretty big dig, right? There's a time and a place for safe and being an SPC5 and offering all the safe courses now. I feel like we need to have some balance, right? So he goes on to describe what he calls the product delivery philosophy triangle. And he breaks it down this way. He says, the top of the triangle is agility. This is directly proportionate to your ability to react to changes. Okay. Bottom left corner is uh, predictability. Measurable output for a fixed period. And then the bottom right corner is efficiency. Actual output slash potential output. Now, I think this is interesting because I don't know that I'd pit predictability and efficiency against each other. I mean, I guess I understand where he's going. But he gives the following definition. He said, agility is the team's ability to react to changes in requirements, development time issues, and organizational pivots. You can also consider this how well you react to change. I'm totally good with that. I think that's good. Predictability accounts for the commitments made versus what is actually delivered at a fixed point in time. If a team commits to delivery of n number of items in a to-do list in x number of days, predictability is how close the team gets to reaching that on average. This is interesting because I think when you start talking about the number of items per day, this is forcing teams to go more or lean in more towards a Kanban approach where they're doing more of a lean approach, first in, first out. But the key here is to make sure everything's small in size. And I think that there's just not enough backlog preparation for most organizations to do that. And this is the whole purpose behind why story pointing works and how if we use properly, Without measurements of time, story points can actually give you a greater degree of accuracy in your estimation. It is, of course, impossible in a real-world scenario to deliver X number of items as was committed since engineering complexities, process dependencies, and people factors come into play. If you're doing story points correctly, you don't have to worry about any of those things. And I think that this whole thing about predictability, you know, I hate to do this, but I think it just blew this whole article out of the water. I think that if you do predictability correctly and you're measuring the right things, that you can increase your predictability so that you don't have to worry about all those other things. And I think this is the reason why he leans in on efficiency. Efficiency looks at how many work packets or items were delivered by the team versus how much they could have delivered. Okay, I think this is straight up management metrics at this point. It's looking at things that really don't matter. If our focus should be on outcome and not output, I don't know how much time we should be spending doing these types of things. In Agile, we have to keep in mind that we're trying to be collaborative, quick, and open to change. And if you can do those things and just measure, inspect, adapt, you know, make adjustments and pivot, you're good to go. And I think that it's too often that we lean on these metrics and on these other pieces and make excuses for why things aren't getting done or um, provide things to management to give them false hope or to have them think, you know, um, that Agile is going to be the one size fits all solution. We all know Agile's not spandex. I've said that a million times, right? So Agile works and it works really well. If what you're working on is liable to change, if you're not sure about the outset, if you're not sure at, at, when you first start what the solution is going to look like and you're trying to build as you go, or, you know, if you need to work quickly and it's more important that you see, you know, MVP speedy results than having things absolutely perfect and polished. And if you know that your stakeholders' needs and wants are going to change and evolve over time. Those are all things that Agile's really good at. Um, Sometimes you might look at Agile and say it's a bad idea if you work, for example, in an environment that requires extensive documentation. 
if uh, if you plan on bringing a whole bunch of new people on board during a project, and you know that you have to do something to keep them up to get them up to speed, uh, or if the product or project you're working on is heavy, heavy compliance related, and you know there's just going to be loads of documentation. Uh, the good news is if you leverage Agile properly, sometimes you can use your backlog item descriptions and your uh, acceptance tests, as well as your testing criteria, your test cases, to form documents, which is rather interesting. But many people don't take that into consideration, nor do they know how to do it. Uh, let's see. If you need completely predictable delivery and you need to be crystal clear about what the final product's going to look like from the onset. Okay. So this one, I, I understand. There are certain organizations that say, we must know upfront exactly what we're paying for, and we want to know exactly what it's going to look like, what it's going to smell like, how many centimeters it's going to be. And if you're in that type of scenario, Agile's not going to work because there's too many things that people are trying to put restrictions on to make Agile effective. So I think more importantly than the focus on what the deliverable is going to be, I think if you have too many restrictions, it causes you to be that way. Also, if your project can't afford to change during its course, if there's no way you can change it and it has to stay the same, or if you don't have motivated people, you know, these are all times where you may want to consider different ways of doing things or adaptations to Agile to make it flow more like a traditional project management method in order to make things work. When you're doing traditional waterfall, for example, we all know that's where you're gathering requirements, doing analysis, uh, loading up on design, doing construction, then testing, and then deployment and maintenance. It literally flows in one direction, and you never go back the opposite way. Uh, hence the name Waterfall, which kind of makes sense now. Uh, but with that being said, it, it has its time and place, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. But I do want to throw one more iron into the fire here that this guy mentioned on the onset but didn't finish talking about. He mentioned SAFE, and he kind of dogged it, even put the word yuck in parentheses. What I've got to say about SAFE is that SAFE is a powerful, powerful tool if it's used correctly. And I think the problem is most organizations aren't patient enough or they don't have the fundamentals in place and they try to do the highest levels of SAFE without having those fundamental layers in place. If you have the basic fundamentals in place and then you approach SAFE, it's going to work like a charm. But if you don't have all the basic needs and things in place that you need, then SAFE is just going to be another way for you to learn how not to do a product or project. So as crazy as it sounds, that's, that's the whole gist. Uh, you know, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Try to keep it short and sweet. As always, we encourage you, if you have an episode or an idea for an episode that you want us to cover, reach out to us at learnmoreatagiledad.com. We would love to hear about your topic. And as always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.